Welcome to Kuwait's Industrial Automation and Control Systems Cybersecurity Conference, KIAX Cybersecurity 2014, 25 through 26 May 2014. Hosted and organized by Equait Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC. So, for our final speaker this afternoon, before we break for lunch, I'm delighted to introduce Glenn Bounds. He's the Director of Cybersecurity Europe, Middle East and Africa at Schneider Electrics, and here to give a speech on defense in depth. Now, with over 32 years in fields instrumentation, control and safety systems, Glenn has managed several oil and gas mega projects. So ladies and gentlemen, let's warmly welcome Glenn Bounds. Appreciate it. First of all, thanks for inviting me and uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces and uh, from all over GCC. I think you're the, probably the farthest away from PDO. So um, I've been around um, quite a while, I guess about eight years now in, the, in Dubai and Saudi region and uh, done a little work here in uh, Kuwait with our friends at PIC and uh, KMPC. So it's good to uh, be here. I, I've been traveling in the last um, year and a half or so mostly in APAC and uh, it's, uh, when I got here eight years ago, I said I was in Central and South America mostly in oil and gas industry and, and some food and pharmaceutical uh, facilities. And they were actually coming along pretty good, you know, in cybersecurity. When I got here, I said, wow, we, I've stepped back about three or four years because everybody was slow to start talking about cybersecurity at that time, especially in 2006. And I, my trip to APAC uh, over the last year and a half, um, you guys are f far ahead of that region. <laughs> I have one customer that's just now talking about, maybe we should you know, start thinking about cybersecurity and uh, actually assigning some people to, to their departments. So it's, uh, it's good to be home again. I've, I've been in 14 different uh, time zones in the last week and a half, so forgive my jet lag a little bit. And I have actually a really good presentation, but I've seen every slide that I have up here already presented this morning, and I apologize for not being yesterday. My flight was canceled in New York uh, because of weather. And um, that's one thing I find it really amusing when I go back to UK and US. <clears throat> they actually have 24-hour weather channels. You know, we talk about weather in 20 seconds. Is it sandy, and how hot is it going to be? Does so, but they have. Uh, we've had a lot of challenges running around in airplanes and airports and hotels trying to get here. So, I like a little interaction. So I'm going to ask for a raise of hands. Who's heard of Red October? Anybody? Yeah, of course. So Red October was a wonderful little malware that was infecting very sophisticated networks all over the world. And uh, I know that's hard to read. I can't even read it from here. But as you can see, there's uh, all those places in red where uh, governments, embassies, diplomatic agencies, research institu institutions, trade and commerce, nuclear energy research, uh, oil and gas companies, of course, military, aerospace, and some, there's still some unknowns who exactly was uh, feeding data to this command and control center. This was actually, had gone on undetected for five years five years until they detected it back in January of last year. So it's for us to think that it can't happen to us is, uh, is quite naive. 
So we need to be vigilant and find out how we can determine if we've been, um, our systems have been breached. So anybody have a computer at home, home computer? I've had one since, I don't know, 1979 or so. The little Commodore 64s and all kinds of little computers. Then it got into the IBM PCs. And uh, you know, you've ever seen this, you've, you have Windows. I know the, the, my Mac friend says, oh, I never see anything like that. Well, you know, put your head in the ground. We've all seen this, BSOD, blue screen of death. This is things that can happen not just because there's a hardware problem or an issue with the computer, but you know, zero day or root kits and, and viruses that attack uh, our operating systems. <clears throat> so the threats are real and the solutions are here. We've talked, we've heard this all talked about this morning and I'm sure yesterday as well. And uh, the time is now because bad things are happening. Would everybody agree that, I'm gonna skip some of these uh, if you don't mind, and because we've already seen a lot of these discussed already. So again, we've, I've heard the previous guys talk about defining cybersecurity. It's very simple, we wanna protect our assets. But do you know there's a war going on? There's government agencies all over the world that are setting up uh, very sophisticated systems that are preparing for, to go to war with each other. And we like to think that this really can't happen. But, um, you know, the NSA thing with Snowden, that was really, really peanuts. What's, what's going on today is much, much more um, sophisticated and, and much more elaborate. And you know who the main targets are? Us in this room. We're the slow moving elephants. We're the buffaloes in the, in the plains. We're easy targets for cyber warfare because what, what do we do? We are the critical infrastructure of our countries, of our governments. So it's very, very, the time is now, keeps ringing in my mind. We have to be vigilant and have to be prepared to do anything possible we can do to protect our systems, especially our industrial control systems and critical infrastructure systems. We can't wait any longer. So again, we want to increase plant safety. We, of course, we don't want any downtime. We want to protect our IP. And now we have internal regulations and external regulations. It's not just North America regulations anymore. Uh, Euro, Europe is uh, in the process of, of um, creating a, a Europe-based um, regulatory compliance. So it's coming. We, we will see that. And then, of course, each country has their own regulations. I know recently because uh, last year uh, Qatar has uh, created their own, their own group. So it's, it's coming. What, is, what cybersecurity is not? It, what I always say, cybersecurity is a journey, it's not a destination. You have to be prepared to go to make changes every day, find out what's happening in your networks today. And I've, I've, uh, I've asked everybody that I've known for the past uh, eight years here in GCC, how can you know what's going on in your network if you're not monitoring it? We've just now been you know, inundated with these new devices, seams that, uh, that monitor and, and, and look at every packet, sniffing every packet going, going across your network. We should have been doing this a long, long time ago. 
You know, we've had the technology available, but we haven't, uh, we haven't utilized it. Now we've, I've just, uh, we're just installing our first seam into to a customer site here in uh, the GCC. And um, I think it's a, just a matter of a short time before other customers and do the same thing because you have to monitor. If you're not monitoring, what, how could you possibly figure out or know what's, what's going across your networks? So you've seen this, I'm sure, um, the last two days. Uh, defense in depth. We have you know, the onion, the cake, the layers, all the wonderful things that uh, we talk about at Defense in Death based on ISA 99, IEC 62443. So all these standards have introduced us to this Defense in Death uh, topologies and, and uh, recommendations. So we have, we have a good standard to base it on and, and to assess against. Uh, I, I always hesitate to say audit because uh, in order to audit to one of these things, they would have to be published. And to, as of today, ISA 99 or IEC 62443 are not fully published. They're the only ones that are uh, finished are WIB, and, uh, which is a shell um, initiative, and um, you know, of course ISO 27K. So these are the ones we can audit again. Everything else we do, gap analysis, assessments, whatever you want to call it. But we're, we're, we can do a lot of good work. And audits are not um, you know, required for, 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 the, for the countries uh, here in the GCC. It's an internal process. So this is uh, something from ISO 27001, and we've heard all this before. We have to monitor, we have to continuously approve, just basically the plan to act, check. And uh, you know, this, we've, uh, one of the gentlemen earlier today mentioned this, this is the typical you know, IT world where we actually have integrity and confidentiality to be the most important. They're all three important, but we always see it as, they always draw it this way. But in the OT space, we move it over a little bit and uh, we think about availability as our main priority. It has, our systems have to be available in the control systems world. So actually, I started out in 1975, I think it was my first job, in the most secure site out offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm from Louisiana, and my father was, uh, was a, a, owned a contracting business, and I started off in, uh, offshore a, as a summer job. It was the most secure site that I've been on in my entire life including the ones I've seen today. And I was just in a, uh, a nuclear site uh, a month ago in Australia that had two knocks and socks, two centers that watched traffic across their networks. They didn't trust just one, so they had another one to watch what they're watching. But the site, my first site, the offshore, Gulf of Mexico, they didn't have one electronic instrument in the entire platform. It was all pneumatic. There was no chance of being, you know, breached. There were no computers. It was all elect uh, electrical devices and and inst uh, pneumatic instrumentation. So I've I've started at the very best and now I'm finally catching up to you know some of the really really uh, nuclear sites that are, are, are doing some great things today. Somewhere in the middle are the rest of us that, you know, that we pay attention to every day. So we can get there. So how we've seen this. This is uh, what, uh, you know, Stuxnet, Shamoon was all based on. 
uh, USB disks thrown out in parking lots and, and someone brings it in and or either inadvertently or maliciously plugs it into a computer on our, our networks and, and you know the rest of the story. We've all seen how this could uh, cripple, an, cripple a company, a nation, and this is exactly, I think, uh, we've had the same scenario happen last week. ICS search just released at a public utility company. They won't give the name, though. And uh, I think we've, I've saw, I saw somebody else had the same um, thing that this morning as well. We've, it's not a matter of if we're on the picture, Everybody knows that we are getting more and more attacks every day, and we need to be vigilant. So I think I actually saw something similar to this slide. Human factors, 46% of all uh, root cause distribution of data breaches, uh, system glitches, you know, bad programs and things, uh, uh, hardware. And then malicious or criminal attack is only a, uh, you know, less than a third of, the, of the, the data breaches, causes of data breaches. So human factors are, are the biggest proponent, I mean, biggest cause of any kind of breach in our, in our networks. We need to pay attention to, to that more, more vigilant. We have, um, I just was visiting a site over in uh, KL and the guy said there's no way this could happen in our company and so we were in a small little room and I walked around the back of uh, the table where, where I was presenting basically the same presentation and there was an engineer that just got up from her desk and she hadn't locked her machine or anything so I said if I went, walked over to this engineer that just walked up and sat down at her computer you mean there is nothing I can do your network that, that will cause any problems. I, I pulled out a USB stick out of my pocket. I said, can I try? And he goes, no, 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 no. You know, well, maybe there, is a, there are some things that we should be doing better. And I wholeheartedly agree. So we've seen this exactly same uh, slide in, in different presentations. So I'm just going to... Uh, skip through a few of these. And of course, the big S's, that's some actual text, uh, text from uh, Shamoon. Then same thing with Stuxnet. We've all done the studies and read the books. So, oops. So this was uh, some information I gathered in the last couple of weeks. Um, the average, in the UK, the average uh, annualized cost of cybercrime incurred in an organization was 11.56 million. And uh, this is an increase of 26%. And I think I, someone mentioned that earlier this morning. Sorry, I'm still brain dead from the jet lag. I can't remember names. So what do we do? And I'm going to skip through all this because you can read it later. These are the things we know we must do from, again, the standards, uh, best practices, policies, and procedures. They're, they're all there for you to read. And I'm sure you've had, you, have, you know these. Everybody's seen this. And some people say there's five layers, some people say there's four, some people there say there's seven. The main point of the drawing uh, is that we should be segregating our traffic and protecting one layer from above. And our most critical assets are at the bottom. That's where we want to make sure that we protect from anything above. So what do we do? We do a, a uh, security face. Uh, focused implementation of all projects that we do today. 
we have to do this. It's uh, every RFQ I've seen from all over the world, you know, specifically mention uh, IEC 62443, ISO 27001, uh, ISA 99. So we, we, we as vendors, we have to provide this. We give you the tools and your, with your best policies, practices, and procedures, we move right along and, and we can uh, achieve those results. But again, it's still just a step in the, in the path. We just finished a, 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 a custom active directory at uh, my friend with PDO. Uh, we put our system, our, our active directory system, and, and onto the same, their existing one that they had for their plant automation network. I think Honeywell's is also on there. So we can play well with others, and we do. It's all for something that we, we have to do for, uh, for you as a customer. So finishing up, cybersecurity should be the primary part of R&D. Uh, Snyder Electric as a company, we've uh, just uh, made the commitment to our um, partners around the world that we would follow ISA Secure, EDSA from our manufacturing, firmware, software uh, creation point of view. It's a published standard and we've, uh, we're fully behind it. And oops. Uh, it's the creating and maintaining a plan. Our policies, procedures is a must. I, I am, you mentioned that in the previous presentation, excellent. And uh, it needs to be designed in layers and conduits. We, call, we used to call them network seg segregation. Now they have different terms, but it's all the same. And training, 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 employee training, we, we can't focus it enough. In, and talking about social networking, we need to train our families. We need to train our, our friends. There is no reason in the world today why you should open an email from somebody that you don't know. You may have possibly a small chance that you won the lottery in Nigeria, but it's probably not true. So do not open those emails. They're full of garbage. So uh, it's amazing to me. I mean, my mother, bless her heart, she's 87 years old. She gets all these emails and opens every one. So uh, fortunately, I have whitelisted her machine. So nothing she does can break it. And uh, I protect her. And, and uh, I have to take control of her machine every once in a while and make sure that she hasn't done anything uh, unique. So our friend, we, we all think we're very, very smart people, and most of us are, except my mother is, you know, questionable. She's, she's done a lot of silly things over her life, especially the last uh, 15 years since I bought her her first computer. But, uh, she, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, is the definition of insanity. Any questions? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're opening the floor now to question and answers. You may have some questions for Glenn, or maybe some questions about his mother and her computer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, open to the floor your name, your company, and your question, please. Uh -oh. uh, Jamal from uh, <laughs> Development, uh, Oman. Maybe, I don't know if this question related to you or Microsoft. I remember Microsoft, they said that Windows 7 and Windows 8, you can do white listening on it. I don't know how true is that. Yeah, we just uh, implemented white listening in a very large company in Qatar. I don't know if there's anybody here from Raskas, if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, they had, uh, I don't know, uh, 200 machines. We whitelisted the entire control system. It's running on Win 7. Actually, we're running some of them still on XP. So XP, Win 7, I haven't, we haven't tested 
Win 8 yet, but uh, it definitely works on XP and uh, Win Windows 7, no problem. You know that when Microsoft actually embedded that in XP, I'll show you. Yeah, that's what I thought. In the OS, starting with XP. I just wanted to help with that because I, I know where the speaker was coming from. Um, Microsoft embedded a technology starting at XP. They call it a software restriction policy, and it is whitelisting. And what's really interesting, two days after I was made aware of Stuxnet, I submitted that to both Microsoft and US CERT. None of them acknowledged it. It stopped Stuxnet dead. So it is there. It's just a technology that so few people knew was ever there. Um, it's, it's different than what the vendors are now endorsing, so it, it, I mean, there are issues associated with it, but it is a very powerful technology. Yes, absolutely. We've got a question just in front of Joel as well. Sir, your name, your company, and your question, please. Yeah, uh, Fahed Lerchaid uh, from KMPC, Kuwait National Petroleum Company. When it comes to uh, security awareness, how would you like uh, guarantee that you have reached a satisfactory level with a big organization among like all staff uh, at that company? Guarantee never. I will never guarantee it. But no, what you have to do is like, is there like a, a comforting measure or something that we can Absolutely. like rely on? Absolutely. Uh, everybody in the industry has uh, has basically the same you know levels that we can. We can show you, sit down with you, and show you what, what is an acceptable um, level of training is for your employees. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it requires getting all departments together. I mean, I, I always tell uh, our customers and potential customers, don't send a bunch of control systems engineers to talk to me. I want to include IT and you know, yes, we need your control systems, we need operations, we need engineering, we need all the departments in the room, decision makers, and say, okay, here is the problem. Now, we have, we have some opportunities here to start training your people and we can go from, you know, zero to as high as you want. But we have, uh, we have acceptable levels and it all depends on your risk risk uh, assessment and your, your ability to accept those risks. Ahmed Al Ghamdi from Saudi Aramco Oil Company. Uh, I would like to ask you about, from your experience, uh, how do you rate the, uh, when you have an attack, usually your system is going to be uh, offline. Most of us using uh, electronics, uh, like data storage, to have all our minerals, uh, contact, and we don't depend on paper. So when you get attacked, usually you have to have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, emergency response plan. And to conduct a drills with your employees, you know, you don't want to wait until an actual attack happens to you or get hit with the virus, then you you get uh, shocked, what do you do? What uh, the operation, what should they do? So uh, is there um, an international procedures for like emergency response systems who govern these actions? Absolutely, there's, there's several um, international uh, companies out there that, that have disaster recovery plans, emergency response plans, you know, basically can procedure that, you know, here's what you would do if you were a bank or an insurance company or a retail outlet like the Target breach. And what not to do, what eBay did last week. Uh, these, there's, there's, there's plenty of uh, guidelines to go by out in the in internet world. But if you want, you know, you ha you'll have to pay some Gardner or ARC type uh, company that would, that would um, you would look to see what the best, you know, world-class uh, system is available. But yeah, we, I've seen some and the, there are some really good ones and not so good. 
And our final question before the lunch break, your name and your company, sir. Dollar. Uh, Abdul Anazi from uh, Saudi Madan. Uh, I have one question um, regarding the operating systems. Uh, we are using like operating systems which are being uh, designed like for client based or for normal people on the for industrial um, like applications. Uh, uh, like if we use uh, or if we develop like operating systems especially for industrial um, uh, like uh, applications. Uh, I'm not talking about closed uh, like operating systems, but maybe open source um, operating systems. Is this going to maybe uh, mitigate the, the attacks or the, the cybersecurity uh, problems which we are facing now? I don't know how to answer that. I, I'm from an old Foxborough school. I had Unix running through my blood. I did not ever want to see, and forgive me Microsoft, to see Windows in an industrial environment. Uh, when I was a customer and user, I, I said, no, we will stay with Unix as long as it's available. Kicking and screaming, then, you know, we'll move, move that way. But it was, the, you know, it was what everybody said. Oh, it was the users that wanted Windows. You know, we have these young people today. They come out of school. They know clicks and mice, and and they they want the ease of use of Windows. Um, is it as secure as what, if we would have stayed in the Unix realm? Maybe, maybe not, because there would be more focus on the from the hackers' point of view to to actually learn Unix and, and get down into the bowels of our, our old Unix systems. So I, I, it's a matter of history, and I think you know Microsoft won the war, and uh, Unix lost, and I uh, don't know of any vendor anymore. I think we were the last ones to put uh, Solaris to bed. But uh, unfortunately, that's the way the market was, was heading. Ladies and gentlemen, great thanks to Glenn Thank Bounds. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I invite to the stage now the following um, moderator and panelists for this afternoon. Senthil Kumar, Mohammed al Bakri, Jamal Al-Balushi, Dr. Indu Singh, Carl Rode, Richard Powell, and Michael Guile. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now Finishing for lunch, I ask all of you to be back here by one o'clock to recommence. Remember, the prayer rooms are out of this side of the room all the way along on the right-hand side. And do not forget that we've got the 15 minute past three draw today and you need to be present. So ladies and gentlemen, we look forward to welcoming you back after lunch. Right now, bon appetit. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC.